Warning, the following program may contain coarse language, strong violence, and brief sexuality. This video was designed for a mature audience, and viewer discretion is advised. Shield of Shade Reviews, review number four, Dark Souls 2. Perhaps you've seen it. Maybe in a dream. A murky, forgotten land. Challenge is an essential element to design to any video game, whether it be in puzzle games, shooting games, or even adventure games. When designing a game, it is always important to keep the players somewhat on their toes whenever they wander into these virtual worlds, so they don't become bored and decide to leave that world for good. Early video games maintain huge difficulty spikes to keep players playing as an alternative to their arcade counterparts, but as time went on, video games gradually started to lose that difficulty as a way to keep new players interested. It's gotten so bad that some some gamers claim that new games are nowhere near as rewarding and engaging as their older counterparts, and because of this, they will never leave their impact on history. Hope for more challenging games began to di diminish as time went on. That is, until 2009 when From Software released their new IP, Demon Souls exclusively to the PlayStation 3 system, where it quickly became a cult hit due to its challenging gameplay and very unforgiving nature. With Demon's Souls being somewhat of a success, From Software immediately began work on a spiritual sequel in order to spread the painful love of Demon's Souls to other platforms. And in 2011, this successor would be known as Dark Souls. Through its unique take on storytelling and addictive and precise take on combat, Dark Souls quickly climbed the ladder of success and is, to this day, lauded as one of the most technically proficient and rewarding video games to ever exist. To this day, this game's legacy can be felt prevalently in new modern gaming landscape. Games like Borderlands and Shovel Knight have subtle easter eggs, and some games just straight up steal the mechanics and ideas from this series. So when the sequel was announced at the Spike Video Game Awards in 2012, much anticipation was placed on the series' shoulders. With more and more people flocking into the Dark Souls experience, this presented a chance for From Software to prove their ability to continue to produce the same stellar games as the prequels without the watchful eye of Hidetaka Miyazaki, the creator of the series. So earlier this year, in March 2014, Dark Souls 2 was launched to much critical praise in an ungodly amount of anticipation. So without further ado, I, Shield of Shade, will present to you my review of my grueling journey through Dark Souls 2. Is this journey to the strange land of Drain Blade truly a worthy experience for our chosen undead, or should the sparrow of the curse have gone hollow? Ladies and gentlemen, tune in and find out. Welcome to the universe of Dark Souls, where everything sucks and things get more and more terrible as days go on. In this world, the gods have abandoned the human race, and as a result, curses and death are constant plagues that roam the earth. Whenever you're not fighting off monsters in an anarchic society full of hollowed adventurers and unfriendly NPCs, you might find yourself as one of the cursed undead a lost entity that is slowly losing their will to live and as a result seeks souls as their only objective in life. The game opens with you, one of these cursed undead, entering the land of Drained Lake through a portal on a lake. Upon arrival, you meet some mysterious old crones who tell you that your journey will end in tragedy and that there will be no end to your struggle. A reoccurring theme in the Souls games, by the way. After your short conversation with them, you are then prompted to a character select screen with a rather, um, limited amount of options especially compared to the previous Souls games. After creating your character, you now begin your long journey to seek a cure to your undead curse, and you set off to lands long forgotten. As far as the actual story goes, that's about it for Dark Souls 2. There's really no more motivation than that, but any veteran of the Souls series would tell you that's not the brilliance of Dark Souls' story. You see, the Souls games are rich with illusions. No, not those illusions, but you'll find plenty of those. These illusions, okay? Throughout the landscape, there are various moments 
monuments and items that have a story behind them and how they got there. For example, you may be wandering a putrid wasteland only to find a broken statue that resembles a certain night of sunlight. Or maybe when fighting a boss you notice a great beast lying in the background, unknown to you why it's there or what purpose it serves. Your only hint is through vague item descriptions and that's the brilliance of Dark Souls story. It's all about sharing theories on what people think happened to this mysterious land and how these events take place. Very little facts are petrified in stone, and if you care enough, you will find much entertainment out of piecing these tales together. That being said, I have stated my opinion on this type of storytelling in my transistor review, and I feel that while rewarding as it is, it is an incredibly sharp double-edged sword. While it is true that this is a rewarding and innovative way for games to tell their story, only the people who take the time to look for this stuff will truly appreciate it. It is completely possible for someone to play the game from beginning to end without missing a single room or item and have no idea what's going on at all. I'm not asking for the developers to shovel large amounts of exposition into my mouth, but I'm sure that I'm not the only one who would wonder why exactly there was such a big commotion about how great Dark Souls storytelling was, and basically had to have it told to me in simpleton terms. Also, that's me, a person who tends to value story more than most, and I find the lore somewhat hard to get into. Of course, many of you have probably noticed that I've been beating around the bush to the actual lore in Dark Souls 2, rather because, well, it isn't that impressive. The most interesting aspect of Dark Souls 2's lore is how it theoretically, see the quotations, is tied to the first game. It's not clear whether or not Drang Lake is directly connected to Lordran, or maybe it is Lordran, and that there are a few landmarks that seem to point to that second opinion. Other than that, everything else is rather dull. There are stories about rulers of the land, there are stories about towers that imprison the undead as a way to keep them maintained. There's even a story about how the people of the land began dumping their garbage into a tomb of a great warrior. They sound interesting, don't they? But really, there are only a few standouts, at least for me. But by far the worst aspect of the story is the ending which kind of amounts to nothing, but really this issue has been present in previous Souls games too. I know it ties into the themes of cycles, but it kind of just ends right after weird plot twists that didn't have a whole lot of build up to it and comes off as kinda unnecessary. But I've been rambling about the plot too long, so let's move on, shall we? One of the most defining features of the Soul series is its intimate combat system and precise controls that accompany it. Every action feels slick and has a weight to it, as if you're actually holding the shield and sword of yourself. One mistake is all it takes for the player to die horribly or embarrassingly, and it just adds to the tension when many thousand souls are on the line. In addition, there's a parry system for a mix of players to use to gain the upper hand, and a wide variety of weapons ranging from swords, claymores, morning stars, rapiers, and even a twin blade that each play different. Magic has just as much variety with miracles, hexes, and sorcery for the more careful players in the game. While I don't have any real experience with magic or miracles, I do have experience in archery, which is pretty solid like it was in the previous game, although archery is a bit toned down in this iteration. The gameplay of structure of Dark Souls is roughly the same as it was in previous Souls entries, in which players enter a new area, die, fight enemies in that said area to gain some experience, die some more, find the boss, and then die some more after that. Then, finally killing said boss, claim their souls, only to make a stupid mistake and lose their own souls, causing the player to quit the game. Constant progression and discovery are the reasons people can come back, and more than likely you're going to find something that you completely missed on the second playthrough, or you didn't see the view blind for a few times. Yeah, you know that tagline on the box, prepare to die? The game means it. Death is a natural part of, game of the gameplay flow, and while there isn't a huge penalty for dying, the game will punish you for it. Losing your souls, the currency of the game, isn't a huge detriment to your progression, but those souls can be used for equipment or level upgrades, and it's absolutely disheartening to see those souls be wasted if you don't recover. Dark Souls 2's gimmick is that every time you die, you lose a small fraction of your health bar, making it essential for players to return to human if they need that extra edge for bosses. Speaking of bosses, this is probably the area that is most inconsistent in the game, because while there are some incredibly entertaining and memorial bosses, they are overshadowed by several completely inept and pathetically awful boss fights. Even worse is the fact that some of the bosses are lifted straight from the original Dark Souls, and most of them just have horrible additions. Instead of Ormstein and Smao, we just got Ormstein. Okay. Instead of just two Belfry Gargoyles, we got eight. Gee, thanks for software. 
the list goes on and on. Boss fights are one of the most memorial encounters of the Soul series, and to have most of them not be the highlights makes me pretty crestfallen to find out that this is the case. But as far as the rest of the game goes, it's still a classic Dark Souls and there's not much to complain about there. So while the core foundation of Dark Souls 2 is solid, there are still cracks around the base. And even though the developers did apply cement to some of those cracks, they did pour waters in others. And as a result, the statue still stands, but it's a bit more unstable. Now with that over with, let's move on to presentation. For the shoestring budget it was running on, the original Dark Souls was quite a beauty for its time. Sure, everything looked like it was made out of pine resin coated in nail polish, and if you entered Blight Town, the frame rate would immediately flip the table and leave the room cursing, but everything did look original and it had a wonderful dark fantasy art aesthetic behind it to make it seem wondrous. However, that was 2011, and it is now 2014, so this game should look amazing because it's got a bigger budget behind it, and... Oh. Oh. oh, why does it look like this? I don't know what happened, but in my eyes, Dark Souls 2 looks considerably worse than Dark Souls 1. There's a lot of speculation that the game was considerably downgraded to make it run on last-gen hardware, and the more you see of the game, the more likely this theory becomes. Lightning is practically non-existent in most areas of the game, and lighting is a big part of the franchise. Plus, there are several areas of the game that seem to indicate that darkness was a big part of area transversal. Between the torch and areas like the gutter in No Man's Wharf, there's plenty of evidence lying around, and one wonders why such a huge element was changed in the last minute. I understand that we're running on last gen hardware, but I think we can at least do better than our prequel. Environmental design doesn't hold up either. The land mostly feels like a bunch of different rooms and areas stitched together. In the original Dark Souls, everything felt connected and natural to explore and walk through as if the game was designed to be a continent. However, in Dark Souls 2, there's so much use of impossible space that it's extremely jarring and almost immediately takes you out of the game. For example, there's an area called Earth and Peak, which boasts a large wind mail that churns poison. After defeating the boss, you are then brought to a lift that takes you up to the next stage, Iron Peak. While it's dazzling to look at, it is an interesting, <coughs> frustrating <coughs> environment. You should notice by looking at Earth and Peak that the Iron Keep is nowhere to be seen. Considering that the elevator goes up and I highly doubt the world is full of aperture technology, one can assume that the level designers didn't put a whole lot of thought into the overworld design. But that's not to say this, this game looks completely awful and has no redeeming content. The overall art aesthetic is still really pleasing, and as you move to the later levels of the game, it really starts to shine. As ugly as some textures and models look, there are still a few cleverly designed enemies, like the spider possessed zombies or race and crypt keepers. There's a lot of small details like the slow degradation of you hollowing out as you die more and more. Really, besides those two major problems, Dark Souls 2 is still a somewhat good looking game, but because of these clear visibility issues, it hampers the experience and will leave many players wanting. The original Dark Souls soundtrack was equally brilliant as it was subtle. Throughout your 60 plus hour journey, 90% of the time you'll hear practically nothing except the clinks and clanks of metal hitting metal and metal hitting flesh, whether it be yours or your enemy. Matoli Sakuraba, those are both Dark Souls games, really nailed the atmosphere and tone of the original Dark Souls. Booming choirs and sharp male vocals really brought to life their dark fantasy aesthetic. And the boss themes are some of the best and most memorial pieces of music that I have ever heard. That being said, I felt that surprise surprise, I didn't think the soundtrack was as good as it was in Dark Souls 1. This is not to say that it's bad, far from it, because there are really memorial pieces in this soundtrack. However, out of the 35 tracks on the soundtrack, only a couple of them really caused the adrenaline to flow during boss fights. Looking Glass Night, Rune Sentinel, Milk Nido are some of the few tracks that really stood out for me, and there's not a whole lot more than that. Other tracks are passable, but do make good background music. For example, Majula's jingle is instantly recognizable, and it will probably stick to many players, but after listening to it for a couple minutes, I quickly had enough and would ignore it for the rest of the duration of its track. I don't know what it is, the choirs are there and the subtleties of the tracks are there as well, but it doesn't have the same impact as it did in the previous game. Maybe it just didn't have as much effort put into it. Maybe a soul soundtrack is only something that can 
we experience once. But whatever it is, it's just sad to see yet another element overshadowed by the previous games. As for the rest of the sound effects, they all hold up pretty well, and as stated before, kinks and clanks are still pleasant to hear, and there's very few things as rewarding as getting your backstab and hearing your steel rip, op rip open the receiver's flesh. Voice acting can be a bit hammy in some instances, but I think that was mostly on purpose due to the scarcity of it, and I'm willing to give it a pass. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to the moment that we've all been waiting. Going into this review, I thought I had a clear-cut idea of what I was going to say, but reflecting on it now, I'm somewhat hesitant about passing judgment on Dark Souls 2. There are many aspects of this game that, that do things a whole lot worse than the previous two entries, and be because it has that 2 in the title, it's incredibly difficult not to condemn this game to, to an, an eternity and the undead but still. Almost every aspect of this game is overshadowed by the previous entries, and with the horrendous infection called Bloodborne rapidly growing closer and closer to launch, I feel that Dark Souls 2 is going to be forgotten in this time as good but unfortunate lesser successor to a brilliant series. See Bioshock 2, Skyward Sword, KOTOR 2 and many others that I'm too lazy to mention. But at the same time, Dark Souls 2 is easily one of the best games to come out of the seemingly in this drought that is the 2014 video game release calendar. So that's my dilemma, and it's a solid game that's definitely worth your time and purchase, but it feels unnecessary when compared to the giants that were the previous games. <sighs> so now that the gun's pointed to my head and the hammer is cocked, I will say this. If this is your first experience seeing or wanting to play a Souls game, I will give this game my approval and recommend that you give it a try. But if if you are a veteran of the series and haven't played this game, even though most of you probably have, and have voiced your opinions and published your builds and guides and all that jazz, I will say, lower your expectations. In some ways it will deliver that wondrous experience, but in many ways it will struggle and fail to impress you. So after gaining several thousand souls and attempting to get to the bonfire only to be invaded, destroyed, annoyed, and losing said souls because of a stupid mistake, then causing me to quit the game in a fury, and then eventually call to my bed and crack myself to sleep. I have decided to give scores to story, gameplay, presentation, sound, and overall enjoyment of the game. Starting with story, which I give a 7 for maintaining its unique form of storytelling, but lacking anything too interesting to keep players truly invested. Up next there's gameplay, which gets a great score of 8.5 for maintaining the polish and finesse of the previous Souls titles but lacking in the spectacular boss fights. Presentation gets a good score of 7.45 for maintaining a solid art style and subtle nudges but having problems with lighting and, look and looking worse than a now 3 year old game. Sound gets a respectable 7.25 for having solid tracks but not having any memorable pieces. And lastly, there's enjoyment which, surprise, gets also gets a score of 7.0. Tallying all these scores together, I give Dark Souls 2 a noble 74% rating and an ultimate recommendation to buy it. It's not the best Souls game by a long shot, but it does have its peaks and troughs, and while the destination night might not be the answer sought, the journey throughout the land of Dring Lake is something I think at least some people should take. Keep in mind this review was conducted with the Xbox 360 version of the game, and was done solely with that version. It is also available for PlayStation 3 and PC too. Prices vary from place to place, but you can probably find a brand new copy of Dark Souls any anywhere from 30 to 40 bucks from all major retailers, brick and mortar, and digital. Also worth noting is that at the time of this recording, September 20th, 2014, Black Armor Edition of the game is still available for purchase, and it is only 10 bucks more. That edition comes with a soundtrack, a steelbook case, and even a miniature art book, so I think it's worth investing the extra cash into. For other game recommendations, I will point you towards the Shin Megami Tensei series for its similar brutal difficulty and rich and interesting lore, but I have only dabbled in SMT4 and many other personal the titles and spin-offs, so take that recommendation with a grain of salt. Also, Dragon's Dog for its similar design philosophy and unique Japanese take on a western style RPG. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I bid you adieu and ask you to leave a comment about any issues or complaints you had with this video. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time. Also, a quick note here, my next review is going to be a bit my like my last one, so keep that in mind when looking towards the future. But one last time, I thank you all and hope you have a wonderful day. This is Shield of Shade, signing off, and I will see you next time.